Hello, everyone. I'm Evo Dalder, President of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, and this is World Review, our weekly look at news from around the world. And what a week we've had. Western leaders are gathering this weekend in Munich. Uh, Vladimir Putin is uh, launching the largest nuclear uh, exercise this weekend, uh, even as the U.S. now estimates 190,000 troops are amassed in Ukraine's border. Kiev is preparing to evacuate, uh, and uh, the evacuation order has already been called for the uh, rebel region in Donbass to, uh, for the citizens to move to Russia. Uh, we've got a lot to talk about this week, and we're so happy to have with us uh, Nahal Tusi, senior foreign affairs writer at Politico. Nahal, great to have you. And Bobby Gosh, who is a Bloomberg Opinion editor, Bloomberg Opinion. Bobby, great to have you back. And Philip Stevens, who is now a, uh, a, a uh, contributing editor to the Financial Times, formerly, of course, chief political commentator for the Financial Times, who writes a new, wonderful uh, Substack newsletter at philipstevens.net. Uh, Philip, uh, Nahal, Bobby, great to have you here. Bobby, uh, bring us up to date. This story is moving literally by the second, uh, but everything, it seems, is pointing only one direction, which is a military confrontation, the likes of which we have not seen in a very, very long time. Yes, it, it looks like that way, as you said at the top, the, the number of Russian uh, troops amassing on Russia's Western borders has now been raised to 190,000. That was 150,000 at the start of the week. There was a moment in the middle of the week when it looked like um, Russia may step back from the brink, but that turned out to be a false hope. Um, I fear that we are in that situation uh, of, of the rule of Chekhov's uh, play, where if there's a gun uh, on the mantelpiece in the first act of the play, before the third act, that gun has to go off. And, and you worry that when Vladimir Putin has amassed 190,000 guns uh, at the borders of Ukraine, then he's counting on shooting some of them off. Um, the, uh, the, the US continues to marshal uh, reasonably well Western, uh, the Western alliance, uh, both NATO as well as Europe more generally uh, against Putin. Um, we've heard firmer than usual words, even from Germany, uh, especially from the foreign minister. Um, and the world waits with bated breath to see uh, whether this will actually go over the precipice into a major conflagration. There were also, of course, the other modern aspects of war, the enormous cyber attack against Ukraine, uh, which, as we've seen before in the case of Georgia some years ago, that can be uh, a, uh, an early indicator for a kinetic action to come. So everyone's got their fingers crossed. Markets are behaving in a strange way, though. Um, the stock market is up. Uh, oil prices are down. Um, investors in both those areas seem to think that war will not happen, uh, but they've been wrong before. Uh, Philip, uh, investors are one indicator of what happens. Others are the intelligence communities, of course, and, and the UK uh, the intelligence community always tightly linked with the US uh, as part of the so-called Five Eyes uh, uh, arrangement um, is, uh, has been sounding the alarms. You've been talking to folks in the community. Uh, what are they telling you uh, and why uh, uh, are, are they are they seeing a denouement for some reason or are they seeing escalation and the likelihood of uh, of tanks and troops moving very soon? I think they're seeing the likelihood of tanks and troops moving very soon, um, perhaps this weekend. I think um, they're persuaded. I think it, across Europe, some of the intelligence agencies have been obviously gathering information on from the posture and the communications of the Russian military. And they, they see a Russian military which believes it's about to go to war, displaying all the, the jitteriness as well as the planning that you see in armed forces before they start a major conflict. So they, I think the view is, you know, no one 
can know what's in Putin's mind and no one can know whether he can change his mind. But I think the view is that if there isn't a war, the most the people who will be most surprised will be the generals who are now planning to send in the troops and the aircraft and fire the artillery. So it's a very dark mood. And I think so it should be. I mean, because it's been running for a while, I think we can forget the significance of this if it happens, which will be, I think, the first war between states in Europe since 1945, I think. I mean, I can't think of another one between states. We've had civil conflicts, obviously, notably bad ones, notably in uh, the former Yugoslavia. And it will be, in in my view at least, the I think the view of a lot of European governments, the Russia finally completely tearing down, tearing up the Charter of Paris, the, the, the agreement that in effect ended the Cold War and guaranteed the sovereignty and the territorial integrity of all those nations that came out of the Soviet Union and who had been, sub, if you like, uh, had been suborned by the sub Soviet Union uh, in the Warsaw Pact. So this will be really the end of that period, the final end of that period in European and global history, where for you know, if not all of it, for quite a lot of it, we thought we might be moving into a world of of rules and order and law. Uh, I think some might say, and I'm sure the Russians would say that the other. Uh, instance in which this has happened was the uh, NATO uh, bombing of uh, of Serbia, um, in, in part in order to support a secessionist movement in in, in Kosovo. But that's a complicated a complicated yeah, it wasn't uh, a war between states in a way. It wasn't one state attacking another state. I don't know. But yeah, point point it is going to be very significant, and it is different uh, uh, than uh, than Serbia in in, in that sense. Uh, Nahal, you've been uh, running around Washington, uh, either literally or figuratively. Uh, I know you've been writing a lot about uh, about the mood in, in in the State Department in particular, but also uh, in other places. Um, uh, I, I see only dourness and and uh, grave uh, concern. Are you hearing anything different from your sources about? Uh, where they think this is going, um, and well, of course, we'll talk about what what will happen if it happens. Uh, but sort of, uh, what's your sense of of uh, Washington? Is what we're hearing outside from the president, from the Secretary of State, from everybody else, what you're also hearing inside? Yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, I think I said on this program a few months ago that um, I'd never seen my sources quite this alarmed uh, about a Russia related issue, and that has definitely continued. Um, I'm not hearing like any good news. There's, you know, everything from questions about, well, why would we have, why would Russia have such a major number of troops in Belarus if these are just exercises um, to just general, you know, like frustration um, with certain allies that they don't seem to be quite getting the message. And one of the reasons the U.S. is actually declassifying so much intelligence and sharing it so much is to convince its own allies, uh, not simply to like, uh, you know, stand up to Russia. Um, so yeah, there is a sense of, you know, being dour and, and pessimistic. I mean, nobody believes anything the Russians say. Uh, they're much more interested in the actual moves. And if you look, for instance, at what happened just earlier this week, you know, Putin announces, oh, yeah, we're withdrawing some troops. Um, and then within a couple of days, the Americans are like, uh, you added 7,000. What are you talking about? Um, so it's these types of things that, you know, have led to like a very pessimistic type of mood. And I, I do think at the same time, you know, some of this is being influenced by past experience, right, especially Afghanistan. I think there's a sense among a lot of folks that we're better off in the U.S. being pessimistic and dour and ultimately being wrong than we are to like downplay this and ultimately be accused of not preparing for a worst case scenario and not sounding the alarm when we should have. So, you know, there are some people who will argue, well, maybe if Putin does not invade, it'll damage U.S. credibility. But when I raise this with people, they're like, you know what, we would rather we would rather be wrong um, and him not invade uh, and take that risk than take the other approach. So, Bobby, uh, uh, follow up on that uh, in the sense of, 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 you know, how would you think the administration has handled 
the, this issue up to this point, and not not just the United States, but but every everyone. Do you think the strategy of of exposing what was happening early on, both as a way as as Nahal said, uh, of building a coalition, but also frankly to try to figure out if there's a way to divert uh, uh, Putin from the path he seemed to be on, was the right one? Uh, how how do you uh, how do you look at it? And even you know th- this issue of what happens if you cry wolf and and turns out the wolf didn't come, uh, what impact that would have? How do you think they've handled this uh, overall? Well, if I can start with the second question first, I think at this point, if there is not a, an invasion or a further incursion into Ukraine, um, I think uh, Putin is the one who stands to lose the most credibility. He he will be the one who will be seen to have uh, blinked in the face of Western um, unity uh, uh, and consistent uh, sort of pressure. He's the one who moved 190,000 soldiers. Um, the, the Western troop movements have been much, much smaller in comparison. So I think he will, even given his mastery, his control over uh, all the instruments of, of uh, communication within his own country, I think he will struggle to persuade uh, even Russians that this is some uh, great victory if he backs down. Um, as far as the Biden administration's handling of it, NATO's handling of it, Europe's handling of it, I think it's a lot better than I expected uh, it might be. Um, and with every passing day, uh, that impression solidifies in my mind. I think uh, Biden's done a good job um, in pulling together the uh, the the free world, uh, if we like, um, because this also includes Japan and, and, and other countries. Um, I think the Europeans have played uh, uh, sort of, you know, a big role. The Germans, as I said earlier, are beginning to finally uh, speak more firmly than they did at the start. Um, I think Macron's shuttle diplomacy you know, we, we all enjoyed uh, a, a, more, a, a, little, a few giggles at, at his expense when he sat across that enormously long table with Putin. But I think that has helped. It has helped communicate uh, a Western uh, unity. Uh, and I think, you know, others have made this point, uh, which is that Putin may, uh, at the end of the day, if he does uh, his math, he might figure that, the fact that his actions have brought Europe together in the way that they have not been in a long time, that his actions have, if anything, strengthened NATO, made NATO more attractive to countries who are not members of NATO. Um, All of these things, uh, I think, talk about unintended consequences. I don't think this is what Putin was intending at the start of all of this. Yeah, no, I think that's uh, that's a, an apt point, Philip. You and I uh, at this stage normally would be sitting in some German Stube, uh, eating uh, uh, sauerkraut and Wurst uh, in Munich, uh, and uh, uh, together with uh, with other of our friends and colleagues, and and talk about how the West was once again in crisis, uh, because that's usually what we talk about. Because the West usually was in crisis. Uh, this time, uh, if we were sitting in that Stube, would you share? Bobby's sense of uh, the, this alliance has really come together and, and in a sort of an old fashioned way of American leadership, uh, herding the cats into a uh, moving in a single direction. And even when they move in a, in, in a different direction, it is supportive, uh, as Bobby said uh, about Macron, uh, of the overall uh, strength of, of the alliance. Is that how you see it? Yeah, I think there is a general view that um, American leadership has been um has been skillful and partly because it's soft touch. It's given others room to breathe. It's given Macron space to go off to, to Moscow. It's given the Germans, you know, some space to go through the agonizing that they always go through at times like this about Russia. And so, um, but it has pulled in a consistent direction to firm up the West position on the principles at stake here. You know, those principles of territorial integrity and national sovereignty, the right to choose your uh, allies. So I think it has been skillful. I wouldn't, you know, I, I, I take a rather different view from Bobby about whether, you know, whether this would, if Putin pulled back now, whether it would be bad for him. I think, for example, like most Russians, for example, would celebrate because most Russian, most Russian people don't want to go to war and see their 
sons and daughters uh, potentially at risk. I think Putin could also claim to have we like paralyze the West effectively in, in, in some respects for the last few months and taken the world's attention. But I think this, the other thing is if he pulls back, I think, you know, it would be a mistake to think this is the end of the story. What Putin has done is laid out some claims which are essentially inimical to the terms in which the Cold War ended. And he said, you know, we are going to reestablish a Russian sphere of influence under which you know former republics of the Soviet Union are going to have to do what they're told from Moscow as far as foreign policy, et cetera, is concerned. And he's not going to give that up. So if he pulls back now, we'll see further pressure. And the question then for the West is, will we hold together if that happens? Will the Germans, who have sort of finally, I think, just got some resolve, will that resolve dissipate if Putin... You know, magnanimously in his terms, pulls back and says, OK, I won't invade. You know, one of the big fears I've heard diplomats say is, were he to do that, would the German government say, OK, so we'll go ahead with Nord Stream 2 now, that's fine. So I think, you know, this is, you know, everyone hopes he won't invade, but I don't think serious people thinking about it think that'll be by any means the end of the story this is a story, as long as Putin is there and repudiating the basic principles on which, you know, Europe's security architecture rests, then we're going to have problems. So Western unity now, great, holding it together. It will hold together if there is a war, of course, and I think there will be very profound sanctions uh, and the Europeans will be, you know, will be, go along with that and encourage that. Whether They'll do more than just sanctions. I don't know. I think they certainly should be thinking about recalibrating the whole relationship with Russia if he invades. But if he doesn't invade, I think, you know, there's more trouble ahead as well. Yeah, I, I think, Philip, uh, and just sticking to this this question, pre-invasion yet, because the rest is the rest is speculation. Uh, I, 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 you know, I think there's this tendency to think that we are not only at a turning point, but that we will know everything no matter what once it happens. If if he pulls back, you know, diplomacy will have won, deterrence will have won, and 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 every we can go back to where we were before. And frankly, if he invades, then everything is over. Uh, neither is the case. They're just next the next step uh, in a staged of uh, uh, set of of. Uh, a, a long, next steps along a long road in which Putin seems to me is not only wanting to control the former Soviet space, including the governments in, in the nominally independent countries, as he's demonstrated over and over again. But he wants to overturn the post-Cold War order, as as you say, Philip, yeah. signified in the Charter of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Paris. And I think, frankly, this is what we saw in the Xi-Putin statement. They want to get rid of American dominance in the world. Yeah, and this idea of American leadership, and none of that is going to go away. No. Invasion yeah. or no invasion, this uh, is going to be a long war. Whether it's a long hot war or a long, you know, warm war, as it were. Uh, either way, this is a a long struggle, and this is why I worry that people just think sanctions are the answer because it's not. We're going to have to, you know, rethink completely the sort of relationship, the relationship we have with Russia now despite the sanctions we've already imposed after the annexation of Crimea, is Crimea. It's essentially based on the understanding that Russia plays by the same rules. If it invades Ukraine, it will have said definitively it doesn't respect any of those rules. So we'll need a new relationship. And that means a new political, diplomatic, uh, business relationship, not just a few sanctions you know, on this industry or this financial sector here, we'll we need to re, we'll need to rethink, and that's going to be a tough business, and that will test the alliance. Now, I want to come to you both on on sort of this issue of uh, whether Putin, uh, you know, loses or or doesn't uh, if he doesn't invade, but then also you've written over the week uh, on the sanctions issue and how that is seen and and, and its impact. It's, likely or not on, on Putin behavior, both immediately, but also, I think, as Philip rightly says, over the longer term, how are those being seen 
uh, in, in Washington. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of good points to touch on here. Um, you know, in terms of the sanctions, what we keep hearing from uh, folks across the the, the Atlantic <laughs> is, uh, you know, we're going to have unified sanctions. They're going to be swift. They're going to be severe. Uh, the reality is that um, they're not all going to be the same sanctions. We're not all going to be targeting the same entities. Uh, the EU, simply for political, logistical reasons, is probably going to be a little bit slower on imposing some of its sanctions. Um, just, you know, they have to get these approvals and things. Uh, and then the question kind of becomes, you know, how long do you keep the sanctions on and how do you keep maintaining them and how much room do you uh, allow to uh, escalate? Because if Putin just does invade and gets these sanctions and just keeps going on with it, um, you know, do you do you run the risk of at a certain point, um, you know, the U.S. Or, or European businesses or others basically lobbying to say we need to like ease some of these things. We're losing market share or whatever. I mean, there's all sorts of forces that could come in that could make it harder to enforce these sanctions in the long run. But there's another point, too, which is like, let's say he doesn't invade. Let's say he backs off. Should he be allowed into polite society <laughs> on the world stage ever again for doing what he has done? Shouldn't he be punished just for like doing what he's done so far? I mean, he has in many ways changed the conversation and gotten, in, in my opinion, a lot of what he has wanted. I mean, he has made the question of NATO expansion uh, become much more controversial uh, than it was before. He has exposed cracks within the right and within the left in the United States on this issue of, you know, how much do we stand up for a country like Ukraine? He's done a lot of things that um, undermine the West, even as it looks like, you know, on, on the, the facade of it, that we're all unified and rallying together. So I, I just, you know, in the long run, the question for me is if he doesn't invade, you know, do we, do we keep like talking to him? Do we let him like show up at these forums or wherever? I mean, is this the type of thing where we just say, okay, fine. Cause he'll just, you know, he'll just do this again. Um, and he could, I mean, so I think these are questions worth, you know, asking like in the long run. And one other angle to think about too is look, if you're thinking very much in the long run, um, what about the, uh, the relationship between Russia and China both she and Putin intend to stick around a lot longer than Joe Biden, uh, and you know if if the you if the world does you know decouple from these two countries um, in in a way that it looks like so many countries are trying to do, led by the U.S., does that push them closer together? And are we risking an even bigger conflagration? You know, years and years from now, that has them on the same side. I, I just think these are things worth. Contemplating, and I can tell you guys, one group that is definitely contemplating them is the group that's writing the national security strategy in in the White House. Which <laughs> basically they've had to kind of like hold off on releasing it because they're waiting to see what Vladimir Putin is going to do and how that will impact this strategy that was supposed to be so China focused in the first place. Uh, yeah, uh, a good if question. I could just come back on that point, Eva. I think sure. that this is absolutely right. We have to think of not just sanctions, but we have to think of decoupling. I mean, I heard a European say the other day, well, like the Russians may shut down their airspace to civil flights. Well, in the Soviet in Soviet times, it was shut and we had to fly around the Soviet Union. And we've got to start thinking about, you know, not, not re replicating uh, the Cold War measures, but certainly of our uh, decoupling our economies across the board. This is the only, if you like, we're not going to fight a war against Russia. So the only means we have is to, is to say, look, if this is the way you, you behave, then our relationship is going to be a lot more distant. And I think decoupling from the Russian economy is something that is going to be on the table. A lot of Europeans, particularly Germany, are going to struggle with it, but that is going to have to be on the table. And I think, um, yeah. In a fact, you know, it's be hard, a lot harder with China, but with Russia, you know, will hurt because Europe will hurt because of Russian gas, but we can survive. And the fact that we're heading into spring is going to make it easier. Um, but we are going to have to say fundamentally, Europe cannot be dependent on Russian gas to the extent anything like the extent it is today. And if Russia retaliates, we're going to have to have to take that. And that's the conversation I think that will have to happen, whether he invades or not, as long as he 
seeks, as you said, to overturn the post-Cold War order, we can't have the open economic political relationship that we've had for most of the most of the last 30 years. Bobby, I want to bring you in here because uh, you started it uh, in some ways. Uh, cer- certainly want to give you an opportunity to, to talk about, you know, the impact if 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 he does not invade, uh, uh, particularly on not only on, on what's happening in Russia and, and Putin, but sort of what our strategy should be. Uh, I think Philip and Nahal put a lot of great, really good questions on the table. Uh, should we isolate them? Should we disc- decouple? Uh, uh, what and how and uh, the the piece that, that Philip started himself with? How do you how do you maintain an alliance and cohesion, uh, which is at the moment driven not only by American leadership but by a real threat? Uh, if that threat not disappears, but 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 uh, becomes less central. Uh, how help us think through? How do we uh, how do we think about that? Well, it has to start, and, and uh, it has to start by making sure that over the next six months, before the next uh, winter sets in, that Europe has large supplies of natural gas in the tank. Um, it may uh, it may take longer to change. Europe's sort of dependence on uh, on Russian gas, but at the very least, Europe can do is prepare itself better. If if this is inevitable, if it if it is inevitable that every winter, Putin will play some version of this game of, of holding the gas gun to Europe's head, then Europe had better be prepared. And and uh, Biden, in the at the height of this crisis, was scrambling, uh, sending folks off to Qatar to see if the Qataris could divert some of the gas that they owe their clients in Asia. Um, sent, we, uh, you know, they sent overtures to the Japanese asking if they would allow some of those gas supplies to be diverted to, uh, to Western Europe. Well, we shouldn't find ourselves in that situation again. Um, the tanks have to be full. Um, alternative supply lines have to be ready to go at short notice. And, and if, if, if Biden, if Europe, if the West, uh, call it what you mean, fail to anticipate the next uh, iteration of this, then it'll have only itself to blame. Yeah, no, I think that's, uh, that's right. I mean, I've, I've, been saying, and I had a guess that no matter what happens, Nord Stream Two is ne- never going to have gas go through it. Um, uh, We're never going to have perfect unity either, Evo. We're never going to have, and we didn't in the Cold War. Right. And we've talked, I think, before about the fights that Margaret Thatcher had with Ronald Reagan about Russian gas. So you know, we mustn't assume that you know there is some st- ideal state that we can reach where everyone agrees on everything. The question is, is to have a bedrock of unity where on the really important things, as happened during the Cold War on, say, missile defence, on the really big things, you've got to agree. And then you've got to allow room for a little bit of political difference between different nations. Speaking about differences over gas, there was a young uh, Harvard undergraduate student who wrote a thesis on uh, the gas uh, Siberian gas pipeline crisis of 1982, uh, subsequently published as Ally versus Ally. The man now is the Secretary of State, uh, Antony Blinken. Uh, so <laughs> we, he, he must be li- reliving this every day in one form or another, if he can f- uh, even, even focus on that, uh, Nahal. But, but Blinken's stepdad was also a major advocate of having of engaging economically with countries that you're political adversaries with. He wrote a whole book called Coexistence and Commerce. And Blinken, I remember, wrote a column in the Harvard Crimson or whatever that paper is, like Crimson, yeah. um, saying, you know, whatever, um, that like, you know, basically arguing kind of the same thing. It was it was so interesting. So uh so yeah, it's it's kind of, that's actually a theory that's really like questionable now is like do, right. did it actually pay off to like have commerce with countries that you're at, well that's the, ne- the the neoliberalist conceit that uh economic interdependence leads to uh, uh, an economic liberalization leads to political liberalization i think 30 years later and looking at china i think we have the answer uh of whether that uh, that's the case um uh you know we've talked a lot about what if putin doesn't invade uh but we started off i think all believing that that was the least likely thing to happen because I agree with Bobby. If he doesn't invade, at least in the first instance, he blinked, uh, uh, and uh, you know, famously, 
Uh, and, and it'd be interesting to see whether he blinked because he all, he never intended to invade. He wanted to use it as a means to divide Europe, divide the Ukrainians, divide the United States from, uh, from Europe, frankly, divide the United States, which in some ways he's still very uh, successful at. Even on this issue, uh, watch uh, uh, some TV station uh, nightly at around nine o'clock p.m. Eastern, and you'll find out what uh, what uh, is happening on that. I'm not going to mention this news station because uh, I don't want too many people to watch it, but that's a different issue. Um, but you know, the likelihood is that by this weekend or early next week, we are going to have major, major, major uh, tanks and uh, you know military confrontation. Uh, I like mentioned humanitarian catastrophe. So I, yeah, I want to talk about that. So what's the consequence of this? First of all, uh, on the humanitarian side, Philip, and we forget uh, uh, all too many of us what war in Europe, frankly, war anywhere uh, 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 means. Uh, you just to help us think through. I was struck by the Kiev uh, authorities preparing for the evacuation of 2.9 million people. Uh, 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 that's a, that's a, that's a big number and we haven't seen anything like that. So Philip, starting with you, uh, uh, the invasion happens, then what? Well, we, I, I think we can take it that the Russians are not going to be too careful not to kill civilians and the sort of rockets and artillery, um, that they've brought up to the border is not the sort of, you know, is not sort of precision guided in the sense that you're just aiming for military targets. It's going to be absolutely brutal and thousands and thousands, if not tens of thousands of Ukrainians are going to die and be wounded and injured. Millions are going to flee and flee westwards. Others will, you know, Kiev has a a network at least of civilian basement shelters. They'll be, they'll fill up. I mean, that, but it is going to be a humanitarian disaster. The EU has been doing some preparation to take a whole, you know, millions of refugees, and it will be probably millions. Um, but, you know, that's not going to be easy. Um, and then the question is, you know, how, if the Russians are there, how are they going to govern this, you know, how are they going to, you know, where's the food going to come from? Where's the water going to come from? Are they going to bring it in? Um, this is going to be an absolutely, as I say, humanitarian catastrophe. And while some preparations have been done, uh, I'm sure we will be, Europe will be overwhelmed by it. And, you know, one can only sort of bleed when one thinks of, you know, what Ukrainians face. Why do we think it will go that way? Uh, why, why? Why not take one kilometer at a time, death by a thousand cuts, without uh, rousing the full uh, wrath of the West and the opprobrium of the of the rest of the world? I mean, if Kiev's on fire, if there are millions of uh, refugees, if there are hundreds of thousands of civilian casualties, the Chinese are not going to like that very much. Well, this is what uh, this is what I hear from people in Europe about what his his military dispositions point to the concentration of, you know, rocket launchers, the concentrations of artillery, um, the positioning of attack aircraft. They do, they point to a sort of, you know, blitzkrieg type approach. Now, mm. obviously, he can model it, modulate it, but that's what you know, seen through European military eyes. That's what we're looking at. And I think there, there's, there's, one, there, there's one other issue on the military side, which is you can't maintain the readiness of a force this size for all that long without it actually moving. So this salami tactic, uh, uh, you, you don't need a force this size. Doesn't mean they can't do the salami tactic, but at some point they'd have to pull back. Um, uh, and, and so you would you would know what was going on as opposed to the continuing pressure, even though, even so, I, I don't think, I, I, Philip is right, that the forces are clearly arrayed for a whole series of contingencies. None of them are small. Uh, uh, that said, uh, we don't know, right? We don't, it's, just, it's just hard to foresee. 
Well, no, there's no. also there's there's also the other point that you know the U.S. and European countries have said if you have one guy cross the border, we are in, imposing a ton of very severe sanctions that are going to be much higher, you know, on the escalation ladder than they were back in 2014 or 2015. So, um, you know, that's the other part. It's almost like you know, what do you have to lose then at, at a certain point for not taking it as much as you can. Um, but I, I also agree. Like, we don't really know. It could be a hybrid thing. It could be a bunch of Wagner force guys like showing up in Kiev and taking over a bunch of buildings. I mean, we, it's just like any any and all things are possible. And I think and I think that's what makes it, um, you know, really scary. And, I, and it's interesting. People keep saying, well, when is it going to start? When is it going to start? And I'm like, well, you know, just looking at the cyber attacks recently, like we may already be in it right now, you know? Yeah, in some ways we've been in it since 2014 uh, in one form or another. Now, you mentioned sanctions. Uh, talk a little bit about what, uh, and you're right, Biden said an invasion, meaning troops and tanks crossing the border. Um, uh, what kind of sanctions are we talking about? Uh, well, they're not giving too many specific details, but I mean, all sorts of industrial and personal sanctions are possibly on the table. Um, you know, we could go going after Russian banks is absolutely likely to happen, um, but also potentially going after oligarchs that who hide Putin's money. Um, and I like I think, you know, there's been some question about whether um the oil and gas sector will be immediately subject to it. Like I have never heard a U.S. official like rule that out. Um, and I think just simply the Nord Stream 2 situation suggests to me that they will find ways to target that sector. That is a ma- major, it is the major part of Russia's economy. So I don't understand how, you know, we would hold off on that, um, you know, unless there's some, you know, concern about uh, Europe. But I, I, I think I think it seems to me like everything is on the table. Um, SWIFT, which is the, that international banking um, service that is very critical that a lot of banks use, we're getting the sense that that is not going to be on the table immediately. Um, but I don't think that's personally, I mean, I don't think that's, you know, permanently off the table. I think that is a possibility. Um, so these are kinds of things that they're still working out to a certain degree, which is kind of, kind of weird because you would think they would have worked all of this out by now, but they're still, still trying to dot their I's and cross their T's. I think the, I think the British sanctions, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Bobby, let uh, Bobby. I think the British sanctions will be uh, yeah. will be very important in this as well, uh, because that's where so many of Putin's cronies and perhaps Putin himself through them park so much of their money. Um, I am personally skeptical that the Europeans will be able to line up serious sanctions for reasons that Nahal spoke to earlier. Um, this notion that they have to get all 27 members of the EU to sign up uh, to agree on sanctions almost guarantees that they won't happen. Uh, but if there are very strong American sanctions, as we've seen in other parts of the world, that may be enough to impose real pain. And if that's accompanied by tough British sanctions, then that will uh, uh, direct that pain at the people uh, who we want to hurt the most. Just, I can, think can I just make one, one quick point Thank about the country. British? Sorry, the British Sorry. sanctions. Sorry. You, On the you British. Could- yeah, sorry, go ahead, Phil. It's okay, go ahead. On the, on the British, I think um, you know, Britain's record on this is disgraceful. Yep. Uh, the present government's record is absolutely disgraceful. There are, I'm pleased to say, real tangible signs now that the government uh, has been shamed into doing something. There's a lot of oligarchs' money in London, and most of these oligarchs have pretty direct links to either to the Kremlin or to the state enterprises, which effectively are run. So I think we will see a clampdown in London. The other place you've got to look is Germany, where, and you know, a certain amount, it doesn't have all have to be EU. Countries have a certain latitude. Germany is Russia's second largest trading partner after China. Germany supplies Russia with lots and lots of engineering material, which I know uh, uh, American officials think, you know, can easily be classed as dual use and therefore not be sold. Can So there's a regulatory system. So a lot can be done. I think one other point, and uh, 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 I'll stop, is we have to realise that the Russians have got a record level of foreign currency reserves at the moment because of the high oil and gas price. So they can take some pain 
for quite a long time. So, you know, we shouldn't expect, you know, sanctions to be put in and Russians to feel feel it immediately. This is going to be a long, longish process. Sanctions always take a long time, uh, uh, for sure. Nahal, you wanted to jump in as well. Actually, Philip kind of made my point, which is like, the UK sanctions, and, and you have to kind of ask yourself, like, shouldn't they do this anyway, even if yeah. there's no invasion, even if Russia has done nothing? I mean, shouldn't the UK crack down on this this corruption anyway? I, yeah. You know, just... Yeah, no, absolutely, about- absolutely the case. Uh, before we end, uh, uh, I mean, my view, Bobby, on the EU is not as dire as yours. Uh, uh, I think all the indications are... And, and I, I, think, I have only two words for you, Viktor Orban. Yeah, no, no, I understand. I understand Viktor Orban, and 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 I get it. By the way, he's got, he's got a tough election coming up, uh, um, and and Russia is a part of of that discussion as well. I I agree that Viktor Orban is a is a real issue, which is why I think the real debate within the EU right now is the trigger. What's going to trigger the sanctions? And 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 the worry in Washington is that the trigger may be higher than Putin initially delivers, uh, and so. But you know, if 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 the the kind of military We've been talking about a major massive invasion. There's no doubt in, in Brussels that I see that Orban won't be able to, you know, to veto that unilaterally, uh, particularly since he's a lot, big, big loss in the European uh, Court of Justice on the question of whether the EU can withhold funding uh, uh, now as well. Uh, I, I want to, uh, one thing I don't hear enough about, and maybe that's because we don't want to talk about it, but when you have hundred and 50, 90, how many people uh, militarily engaging a, an army of 250,000 in Ukraine, uh, plus uh, significant uh, civilian uh, capabilities, the risk of escalation, the risk that something goes wrong, the risks of uh, some aircraft that wasn't supposed to be in a particular place from uh, a NATO uh, country getting shot down, as indeed happened in the midst of the uh, of the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, when the... Um, Russian shot down an American uh, spy plane uh, uh, near Alaska. Uh, I mean, uh, there's so many risks of things getting going wrong. Uh, should we be worried, uh, uh, Philip, about escalation, uh, about this yeah. actually becoming a war that involves not just Ru- Ukrainians and Russians? Uh, well, we, but- should, we should note that Putin himself is presiding over nuclear exercise, nuclear missile exercises over the weekend. Um, we have to hope that even as, you know, there is this great antagonism caused between the US and Russia by Putin's actions, that the lines on, you know, to prevent nuclear escalation at the very least stay open between Washington and Moscow, because that's that is a real, I think, danger. I mean, I think, you know, both... I think both sides will be, you know, conscious of that. And I think some of the old Cold War mechanisms which were developed to prevent such accidents may well come back in into play. But, yeah, if you have a... And if it starts going wrong for the Russians, which it might, um, then there is a real risk. And, you know, if the Russians start to think, well, you know, maybe we should have a sort of separate push into the Baltics and start, you know, put, um, stirring up problems with the Russian populations there, then there is this risk. So, yeah, this is not just, this isn't just about Ukraine. This is about the European peace and, to a degree, the global peace. As Eisenhower said, uh, maybe in the wrong uh, context, if you have a problem you can't solve, enlarge it, and that may well be what uh, Putin does if he gets stuck uh, uh, I think we we, we need to be uh, we need to be worried about that. Uh, Bobby, uh, final word. Uh, uh, what are you most worried about uh, on, on uh, if if there is this military conflagration? Um, uh, what do you what do you think we should we should we should focus on? Well, immediately uh, uh, minimizing civilian harm. That's got to be priority number one, uh, and and making sure that the, the millions of refugees who head uh, westward. Are, are cared for and protected. Um, that's the that's got to be every war I've ever covered. That's the 
that's the one thing that countries don't prepare for. And, uh, and if, if we talk about, it's an old cliche about generals always planning for the last war. Well, this is one aspect of the planning they always, but always fail to uh, do. Yeah, absolutely right. We, we've got to remember that uh, war uh, isn't the game. Uh, it affects real people uh, directly and indirectly in ways that uh, are are hard to uh, to contemplate in the middle of Europe uh, and indeed in, in, in the world. So sober, uh, sober conclusion, uh, though, I think the analysis uh, that all of you have given us today, a lot of things to think about as we move forward. I want to thank Nahal Tusi. Bobby Gosh and Philip Stevens for uh, another great level of insight here uh, on World Review. Uh, if you didn't, uh, if you don't uh, have time to watch it all, subscribe to our podcast, World Review with Evo Dollar, wherever you get your podcast. And until then, I look forward to seeing you next week for another edition of World Review. Thank you all. Thank you.